Canoes were a very important means of transport in the 18th century. Uh, in the journals, they talk about it all the time. I want to have that experience. I want to try out one of these canoes. Eric Vostein is the expert on that around here. He's got several different canoes and he's got one that we can try out. Let's go see what it's like. Hey, Eric. John. Hey. So uh, you got a canoe out here, right? I do. Hey. I do. <laughs> So, uh, I don't see a canoe. Well, <laughs> there's a reason for that. The canoe is actually stored underwater. Okay. It's, it's just off to the left of the dock over here, and it's probably under about that much water. Okay, and so they, you always store it underwater? That's always. the best way to do it. Always, and when I'm done using it, I put it right back underwater. It, stays, it lives underwater all the time. Okay, well, we'll watch you get it out. Okay, <laughs> well, well, here we go. That's incredible. So how long has this one been submerged like that? About six years. Yeah. And I've had it pulled up. I've taken it up out of the water maybe five times in that six years for a day or two at a time. And that's how they would have stored it in the time period? They just Absolutely. sink it? And... Absolutely. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Uh, there, there are a number of reasons that we can get into later. Right. But yes, that is how they are stored. So and they and they did a canoes like this for hundreds of years, thousands. Thousands. Um, we know at least the 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 record seems to show that over at least six thousand years, this exact type was made from Florida all the way into Michigan, uh, the entire eastern half of the United States, inland areas. And if you store them like that, that means that it could be that there are thousands of these canoes still out there. There could be at the bottom of these lakes. There could be. Wow. Yes. That's true, because if someone just happens to pass away before they come back, or one tips over and sinks in the middle of the lake, if it's waterlogged. Right, there it is. There it is. But this one certainly isn't waterlogged. No, this one this one floats after six years underwater. Wow. So it's still not waterlogged. I'm, I'm ready to get in it. All right, let's, let's go. do it. There we go, I'm ready. All right, let's do a shove off here, and I'll hop in. Maybe. There we go. Oh yeah, they're, they're good and stable. Now we could probably tip this if we tried. Oh yeah, but, I think so. But we're not gonna do that. This experience, you know, in, in a canoe just like they would have had in the 18th century, it is so nice out here today. Uh, very quiet, very silent. This kind of canoe, uh, you don't get the same kind of modern clunky canoe sounds. Uh, it's, a, it's a very smooth uh, canoe. It does not uh, tip very easily. It is just an amazing canoe to use. And, Really incredible experience. All right, well, what Ooh. did you think of your first solo dugout canoe paddle, John? That was incredible. This thing is so smooth out there on the water. It's a windy day. Normally you'd be yeah. worried about all this. This is 
stable. Yes. It's slow to react, which is actually really nice for the beginner. It's great in a lake, not so good in a, in a, in a right, river. You'd want right. something you a little shorter. Yeah. Right. But incredible. And it's been underwater for six years, waiting for you to, yep. anytime you need it, pop yep. it up out of the water and off you go. Yep. This was a perfect experience. It's right out of the journals. Those guys were doing this very thing with exactly the same kind of canoe. I loved it. The next step in this experience is, how do we build one? I really need to build one of these. Can you help me with that? I sure can. I sure can. Uh, I've built a number of them and I have a lot of confidence that we can come up with a great canoe. First, we have to find the log and I've always said that a dugout canoe is the highest calling for a log. It needs to be tall, it needs to be straight, and it needs to be untwisted, and it needs to be big. Let's see what we can find in the woods. Let's do it. So I got to admit that I've been excited about this project, and we tried to do it before with a cottonwood tree, but we had a lot of trouble. Well, you'll have to tell me what happened. <laughs> So a few months back, I went out into my parents' woods and we found basically just the right tree. This huge cottonwood that was 40 feet to the first branch. We started off with axes, of course. We ended up using a chainsaw at the end. The tree was huge. It came down and it just shook the wood. The problem is it came down in sort of a pit. We went ahead and, and debarked it, but it was down in this pit. It was impossible. It was impossible to get out. We did end up getting a lot of bark off. We split this whole top third of the tree off, but still, I'll bet that log weighs, even at 20 feet long, probably 3,000 pounds by the time we got done. So, and we just couldn't get it out of the pit. We, we just we couldn't get it out. Well, I've heard that a lot, actually. It tends to be the case that people start a dugout and it somehow never gets finished. And there are a lot of pitfalls and a lot of things you need to be aware of along the way. So it's, it's, it is something that has been tried a lot and failed, has, a, lot. And, and failed a lot. <laughs> and a lot, of, a lot of facilities I've seen have actually had trouble with that. So, um, th and there are some particular construction things that we'll go through as we do this that really help ensure that success. This one, this tulip here looks just about perfect. It is a really nice, straight, untwisted, long trunk. Yeah, so how long, how, how tall do you think this is before that first real branch? I'm gonna say that's 60 feet. Yeah. So we're looking for a tree, like what kind of diameter? I would say a minimum of 25 to 26 inches, and that's a narrow canoe. Right. There are accounts of canoes that are so wide that you could put an easy chair in the middle and grandma could be ferried right. down the river. Right. So 30 inches is a, is a great width. And there are accounts of very, very long canoes, up to 40 and 60 feet long single canoes with many, many people riding. Okay, so we're not gonna use this particular tree. You've arranged for a log? Yeah, I found a log and you know, in if you had your choice of every log, you would pick one, like I said, this is, this is probably the highest calling for a tree and you would need one that were both not twisted, no knots, anything like that. And you would, you could easily then split the top and bottom off to mm -hmm. make your, to make your like plank. Two different ones. Right. Unfortunately, in today's world, this tree is very valuable and it, a lot of times we can find a tree that will work and have it, have it milled first. Right. And that's what I've done okay. so that we can start with something and we don't have to chop through the knots because you can't split through knots. And if the tree is twisted, it will, the, 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 right. the split will twist. Sure. So for trees that aren't perfect, it's, it's a much, it opens up a lot of possibilities for us to use recycled logs and logs that are already being right. harvested. And we're gonna let this one get bigger. Yes, this, there we one, go. this one's not quite big enough, but it's close. It's, yeah. you know, it's that yeah. big. Beautiful, so. just beautiful. Yeah, it is, it's a, it's a stunning tree. Hey guys, you ready to chop? Good. Okay, so uh, this is our tree, right? All right, what yeah. Are, what do we is, got here? This is our prepared, our prepared log, and what we're gonna do now is remove everything that isn't a boat. And to do that, we use a combination of chopping and fire. 
Okay. It's really about that simple, but there are some pitfalls along the way, so we have to make sure we do things correctly. Basically, we want to not remove the outer two edges. We want to stay away from that. Just okay. leave that till the end. Right. And then about the last foot here. So we're going to hollow out everything in here. Okay. All the way down. Well, that's a lot of hacking. Let's get to it. Okay. It's work. So this is a lot of work. We're probably gonna use some fire, right? Yes, I think so. So the first thing we wanna really do, we wanna concentrate on getting a trench about that okay. wide and about that deep all the way down through the center that we can then put our fire in because the fire tends to burn outward faster than it burns down. Okay. So we wanna stay fairly narrow. And then after that, we'll use that to make a fire all the way down the lane. Okay. okay, so we're gonna do a little burning, right? Yep, so we've made a trench here to get started and that'll give us a little place for air to get under. Uh -huh. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna take smaller sticks like these and right. we'll, we may split some wood as well. And we're just gonna stack them all up along here, nice and loose, like right. a nice airy campfire. Because okay. what we want is heat with air right. on this wood to burn it. But we wanna, let, we wanna let all that flow through it. You wanna let all of it flow and then, and then also let it burn clear to white ash. So uh -huh. once the fire's going, don't feed it anymore. Let it burn until it's gone, then add wood again and do it again. Uh -huh. And with each of those, we can expect anywhere from 5 eighths to 3 quarters an inch wood removal. So we don't want to build up ash because that insulates the that's, wood. And that's right. Move it away. Ash, especially down here, right. insulates and it stops oxygen from hitting this wood. We want oxygen and heat on this wood to right. consume the fuel. To burn it up. That's right. right. This first burn was mostly just sort of dried it out and uh, we're going to do exactly the same thing again and see if we can get some actual uh, burn and, and movement down into the log. So it looks like we're just heating it up and there's just a whole lot of moisture in there. It's, uh, it's really sticky work. This is not 
not going all that well right now. It's slow, slow going, slower than I was hoping for. Um, the burning, we're on the second burn and it just, I mean, it just took another quarter inch maybe. And uh, there's so much moisture in this wood. So we're just gonna go, kind of go back to hacking at it cause that's gonna, seems like it's gonna work a lot faster. think John you're looking a little discouraged it's it's it'll go faster I'm sure it will but it's going pretty slow right now so we're not giving up no nope nope we got we got lots of time left so this is this is really really hard uh, we've been at this uh, like a day and a half chopping continuously we're starting to get some real progress and I can I could really connect with folks uh, 200 years ago 250 years ago hacking away in the woods you know making a canoe it's hard work and it's painful um, you know you wake up in the morning and you say another day of chopping but it's it's starting to move along a little bit faster so we're just gonna keep on at it I think you can tell by the chip pile how we've been doing. Oh my goodness. Wow. Wow, you guys are choppers. And this is day two? This is day two-ish, yeah. I mean, I worked a little bit over the weekend by myself, but not that much. Um, hacking away at it. And this morning, we really moved through it in, uh -huh. in a great quantity. Great. Wow, it looks, it looks really well, and you guys are doing just a fantastic job here. So... We're at, uh, this thing is 13 inches all the way, right? So right. we want to have, I, I didn't want to go too deep, too much on, on this depth wise. We're about nine inches deep right now, right here. Okay. And pretty much all the way through. Okay, so that gives you about a four inch right, floor bottom. right now. And you would want that, that floor to be around two inches. Okay. So as you come up on that, then you sl slow, slow down, down a yeah, little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. For so sure. we've got another th issue here, and that is, uh, here's a knot. How do we deal with this as we go through? Okay, so knots will leak because of the way the wood shrinks. And so you, you, what, I've actually been through this before, and here's what I've discovered. You know, if you look at these, a lot of these old canoes, these, um, these artifacts, right. they have what, what are they're calling thwarts and they're, they're a thickened strip that goes across like this and they're yeah. really pretty random where they're placed and how yeah. they're placed and there's a lot of speculation as to why they're there. And I think those are for knots. And okay. so basically if you just leave this right. about four inches thick for a little ways on each side of this knot, you give yourself a lot more wood there to help keep that sealed. How many uh, man hours do you think you have on it? I would say that at this point we're running it's mm, 25 something 25? like that boy that's and, that's a lot of work what do you think do we just keep on going what's our, you do. our next step is okay here? so at this point yes i would get that floor to where you have about a three inch thick floor okay once you have that then get your sides to where they're oh an, an inch and a quarter okay something like that yeah and from there it gets a little finer where you don't want to do much deep chopping because you might gouge too far right
Well, John, it looks to me like you're there. Okay. And you've done a lot of work here, obviously. And I think the next thing is to go ahead and flip it over and look at where these knots, look at what the bottom looks like and where the knots are coming through so that you know where yeah, they're gonna come through. what we have to protect, yeah. And then shape up the ends to whichever profile you like. I'm sure you've seen in the historic documentation that there's a number of different end profiles and right. you can kind of choose one. Okay. I guess let's uh, figure out how to get this thing turned over. All right. Ready? One, two, three. Let it, yep, and just let it flop. It'll be all right. Ooh, makes a nice sound. All right, this all looks really good right here. I see right here there's probably a knot under that, but it's covered with good wood, so right. I, I don't think we need to worry about that. And then right here we have a knot that's coming through, mm -hmm. and I suspect that that may leak as, as the wood changes as it ages. All right. And it's a little soft in there. I call that punky. And so as that, you might get some leakage if you don't leave a bulkhead. Now we need to think about the ends, right? Yes, so the ends. So you have basically two end designs that you've seen them both in the historic historic documentation. Right. There's the, the scow end, which just comes straight up like a just a straight sloop. Like a John boat. Yeah, yeah. Like, a, like just a straight end with straight sides. And then there's the, the more bow shape on the hourglass. And interestingly, if you burn the tree down and burn it in two, Right. you end up with that sort of an, uh, natural. A, a natural bow shape on right. there. So it's up to you which of those you decide to use. Um, they're both in the historic documentation. They probably have some differences, but to be honest, I've never made a scow end, okay. so I don't know what that's gonna be. Well, I think what we'll do, the, I think we'll do a scow end over there and we'll do a pointy end over here. So we're just gonna start axing this away and see what we get. So you're gonna try one of each. That's yeah, a great, we'll great do, idea. We'll do one of each. All right. Okay. Hey, it's going, it's floating. It's doing a great job. It's heavy in the water, but hey, it's feeling good. Well, it's a pretty incredible ride for the first time in the water. Uh, it's still, you know, it's heavy. There's a, there's a lot of finish work we have to do on this. We're probably gonna take another easy 100 pounds off when we do the final burn on the inside of this next week, can't wait. Even now, this is a fun ride in a great canoe. It rides way up in the water. You can put a lot of stuff in this. There is the canoe in the water. We pushed it in a couple days ago and I, you know, had fun. It looks kind of great. Pushing it around. It's a boat. Yeah, so I think what, it's- What, what, how, how has the, you've paddled it? 
Yeah, well, I didn't paddle it. I had a pole, so I pulled it around. Okay. Uh, it was great, fun experience. It's heavy. Uh -huh. It's heavy right now at uh -huh. this. Uh, obviously, we got some weight to get out of it. Uh huh. Uh, but it's cool to have a canoe that's like, yeah, it's, it's and it's, oh, we were sore. I bet. After all that chipping wood. I bet, and it makes that paddling all that much sweeter. <laughs> right, right, it does. I mean, everybody's grip was bad and everything because yeah. all holding those tools, so. So uh, how does it compare to the one, to mine, the one that you paddled I, before? I think it's, I mean, obviously you can tell it's still heavy. It doesn't want to, you know, turn as fast. Uh-huh. Uh, so, but, but uh, it's, I think it's going to be, it's going to be a, real, a lot of fun. When it's getting, and it feels good to build your own boat, Oh, gosh, it? it does. It does. <laughs> so the next step, I think, is a burn, right? Yes, I think so. So we're going to gonna get some of the, the, some of the weight off, some skinny up those sides. I right. think burn is going to be a lot faster than chipping it out with the tools. It will at this point because right. you're, you're able to put enough fuel in there to really make a lot of heat and, and, right. and get some work right. done with it. So we're just, do we just stack it all up in just there? Just stack it up in there and pile it so it's a little higher than the edges and then wow. be ready with the water because if it goes too fast, you have to put it out quick. Okay. So uh, tell me what we need to do to make sure we don't damage this boat. Okay, so for, for just for safety of the boat, you want to be ready with water all the time. Okay. It's going to burn the sides much faster than the bottom. Uh -huh. As long as that bottom is in the water, it won't burn through, but you don't right. want it to go much less than about, right. about like that. Uh -huh. So you want to be ready with the water, and but, I see you have some mops. But mostly right here is our your, big concern. Yes, you're going to have, it's going to tend to want to burn on the top and burn down, and you don't want that to happen. You want right. to keep that at this, right. at this height okay. all the way along, and that's just going to require a lot of constant water so, application. Okay. Good. Um, and you've probably seen that in the in the uh, historic record right. where they talk about having to keep water on them. And that's that's why we go ahead and burn it right in the water. That way you have that water right there ready. Right. And should you need to, you can fl you can just swamp it immediately. Okay. okay. So let's start this fire the right way. What have you got here? Hand drill. Ha hand drill. Hand drill fire. Let's do it. Hey Ryan, yes. just put your hand on that to keep it from going anywhere for me. Tuck this it out bursts of the way. into flames. Well, you know. well, if it bursts into flames, move your hand quick. <laughs> I hate to see my friends get burned. Now that is a fire. Okay. Actually, I like to touch it to a bit of this just for a coal extender. Normally, I would actually just dump that directly in here, right. but in this moist conditions, I'm going to go ahead and use a piece of uh, tinder fungus because it's so easy. Once you have the coal, the tinder fungus will hold it for a long time. I'm afraid we might have uh, some real problems over here with the canoe. Let's check it out. So here's our real difficult spot right here at the end of the canoe. We had this chipped out probably down to about two inches. We burnt this canoe two or three times the other day. And it's really hard to see what was going on down in the bottom as you're burning. It's hard to measure. 
uh, but uh, let's take a look here. This is a foot long stick. This canoe is 13 inches from top to bottom. And what we're looking for is a two inch bottom. So I should have about an inch left on the stick as I measure. And if I come to here, I go down to this low spot. Whoa, we got, we got less than an inch of the bottom of the canoe left right here at this spot. Here, we might have an inch or so, but we've got some real problems. We cannot burn. It's all, we've already gone past what we need to. We cannot burn anymore in this area, the, but the sides are still way too thick. We, we're still got, you know, some places four, five inches of wood to burn off. So uh, we've got to come up with a way that we can continue to burn the canoe, but not damage the bottom. So here's our solution. I was talking to Eric about this uh, early on when we were discussing the burn and he said if there are times when you're getting too far on a spot especially on the bottom you can cover that spot with sand to use as an insulator and so i've got a bucket of sand here that we can put in the low spots and then continue burning there's a problem though with the sand and that is is once we start using the sand we cannot come back in here with iron tools because they will instantly that sand if you hit it it'll ruin the edges of the tools so uh, it's sort of like we're at this spot where we have to choose. Are we going to use metal tools or are we just going to burn from here on out? If I use this sand, we've got to burn. We cannot go back to the tools in any great, in any great fashion without ruining them. We're going to put the sand in. We're going to keep burning. Well, Eric, I, I think we're pretty much done with this guy. We did a couple more uh, burns. I put sand in the bottom mm -hmm. uh, to protect those thin spots because we were getting thin in a couple right, spots. Right. Uh, and then did a couple more burns. And you know, I, I think while we could continue to you know chew on this thing for hours, days, I think it's ready to use. What do you think? I can tell it's going to float. It's a boat. Yeah. It, it's yeah, it's yeah. ready. It, it'll it'll work now. And yeah, you could thin it up a little bit in places, but it's usable as is. Right. Hop in. All right, I will. Take it for a spin. There you go. Oh yeah, it's nice and stable. Comes right around when it starts to tip. Yeah, that's a nice canoe. And that's, it's floating pretty flat. It's it's it doesn't list at all, and that just sometimes they will and sometimes they won't. And you had one that the, the forces balance perfect. Yeah. gives me a whole new respect for people of the past and what they did for their daily needs on a daily basis, you know, having trouble holding on to things or getting blisters where you've never had blisters before and, you know, it's it was a struggle, so, but I think it was all part of the experience and that's what made it important. We worked hard on this. I mean, it was, it was really cool to be able to get into the canoe that, that we built with primarily tools that they had in the time period and and kind of get a small glimpse of what that experience was like for them. It was really neat. I thought the perfect way to end this journey is with a reading out of Cresswell's journal, something that inspired me to make this canoe in the first place. 
Friday, April 14, 1775, this morning Rice and another man began to cut down a tree to make a canoe and have left it entirely to his management. Two weeks later, Thursday, April 27, 1775, we got our canoes finished and our provisions collected together. We intend to set out tomorrow. The next day, Yogahaney River, April 27th, launched our canoes. One of them we call Charming Sally, the other Charming Polly. They're 30 feet long and about 20 inches wide, made of walnut trees, dug out something like a manger. We proceed down the river. For the next two months, Cresswell spends in a canoe something like this, traveling in the back country of what is now uh, along the Ohio River and up into Kentucky on the Kentucky River. He has just some tremendous adventures. And uh, their canoes, they, some, one of the canoes gets broken in half because of buff, a giant herd of buffaloes. They have to repair their canoes. But the canoes are, are what made that travel possible. He could not have done that same kind of trip without a canoe. It's a, su such a pleasure to be able to have access and make um, a canoe like this exactly like they would have done in the time period and uh, you know experiencing using the canoe and and we'll use this canoe later on uh, next year for other kinds of travels but just the making of it and trying it out such a journey right back into history i had so much fun with this project i can't wait to do more <laughs>